Hmm. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. Sup, motherfuckers? Anti Holmes here. The Sonic comics under Archie went through a really bizarre transitional period in the late 90s. What was formerly a book filled to the brim with silly gags, nonsensical characters and just the slightest hint of a serious narrative, would soon gradually change into bleak plotlines, with the characters and even the art direction following suit. Spanning across 1998 and the early 2000s, Archie Sonic would become stuck in what TV tropes would call its Dork Age, where readers started dismissing the book, turned off by how damn inconsistent it had become. I can't clarify that the weird comedic tone had that many fans, but for sure you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who defends the Bollers Penders era of the comic. The main cast were pushed aside for new, less interesting characters, they were like a hundred knuckleses running around, the illustrations started to be of varying quality, Archie Sonic was all over the damn place, but it's not to say that there weren't things that even today fans continue to cherish. You know, stuff like Mina Mongoose was introduced around that time, and artist Jay Axe's penciling were things that especially held up over time. Seriously, look at the detail in everyone's clothes and hair, it, it was amazing. Definitely one of the things that stood out the most in this era. But I'll certainly get to those things eventually. For now, I'm talking about the aftermath of issue number 50, Operation Endgame. As what the writers were probably exclaiming at the time, where do they go after the series Big Bad died? The answer? Uh, don't even try. <laughs> yeah, post Endgame, the fools at Archie Comics were practically scrambling for an idea on what direction the series would go in. Brave New World, which I went into in the last video, was supposed to pioneer the comic in a whole new direction, but it ended up going in circles. Then again, the pre-reboot of Archie Sonic was all about crazy concepts and alternate universes and all that, so surely the comic was going to deliver on a smooth stream of issues for their ever-eager audience. What could possibly go wrong, right? F***ing everything goes wrong! Do you like the new suit? I figured it a better fit for some arsehole trying to school everyone on forgotten hedgy media. Anyhow, it's time for us to see what the hell Archie Comics did when the Sonic book got uncancelled. Hold on to your butts, mothers and fuckers. In this video I'm reviewing issues 51 to 55. Number 51's cover is not bad. Patrick Spaziente almost never disappoints. The Freedom Fighters look great, as do the sneaky cameos in the crowd, although Rota's certainly seen better. That's a face that depicts how I personally feel right now. This issue's story is Reality Bites, otherwise known as the finale that the Archie crew initially intended. I'll get into that. This issue involves our blue hero getting trapped in a VR nightmare, and being set upon by evil, mechanical versions of his friends, including Sally Acorn. I will say the cover is extremely misleading, it's mostly just Sonic the Hedgehog running from these assholes. but then in the end it's revealed that it's all a dream and the blue blur just had this device on his head while he slept. Thinking Dr. Robotnik was somehow harassing him from beyond the grave, Uncle Chuck reveals that the medal was just hacked with a virus that sent him into a strange nightmare. But good thing Sonic's back now, even though everyone is confused as to what the hell just happened. It's a very basic story. You can tell the folks at Archie were struggling with story ideas, where not only do they bring the main villain back because they didn't have the time to think of another antagonist for this scenario, they also forgot to credit the production staff? How do you leave that out? I had to look these bastards up myself, but then again it was a nice surprise. And by that, I mean I realised new main co-writer Carl Bollers is now on the comic, with Reality Bites as his unfortunate debut story. 
Uh, he's not one of my faves, but he's a rather decent writer whose works mildly hold up, mostly for his cool concepts and actual good use of sci-fi. For this issue, while the idea of the blue boy being trapped in a familiar yet hostile setting is good on paper, the execution I felt was extremely lacking. The most I got out of it was seeing how each of the Freedom Fighters appeared in increasingly hostile ways, always taking the hedgy boy by surprise even though the formula gets really stale and we kind of expect it every subsequent time. Not that you could really tell behind the mess that was this issue's art direction. Maxwell's penciling is extremely messy, making it difficult to understand what is going on half the time while the roboticized good guys contort themselves and show up as heads some of the time. Not to mention all of the weird close-ups. It's so unnecessary for, like, this little bit of text. He sure did draw them threatening as hell, though, along with the villain's combots, which works best during the earlier moments of uncertainty. Seriously, the beginning pages where things ever so slightly begin to get f***ed up are probably the best moments of the entire issue, which really isn't saying that much. I did like how he drew Sonic's race car bed though, because of course the fastest thing alive likes to cruise while he snoozes. He's like Papyrus. Despite him not having officially become a writer at that point, Bollers references what the ending of Endgame was supposed to be, back when Sally was supposed to have been killed off and that this Sally was supposed to be one of Robotnik's shape-shifting assassin bots, trapping the hedgehog in a virtual reality by means of a doofy-looking helmet. Yeah, that was meant to be her over there, not Uncle Chuck. I'm glad that they never went through with that, as that would have been a depressing stinger to an already overly serious narrative. But you know, I'm tired of all of this doom and gloom, if you'll believe it. Moving on to the next issue, where the writer's thought process was probably, when in doubt, reference Casablanca. Why Archie Sonic has a canonical zone that's based on a 40s classic is beyond me. It seems to have been writer Tom Ralston's idea, but at least we get a dumb cover of Sonic dressed in a swanky as f outfit. Story 1, The Discovery Zone, has our lovable duo doing speed training, uh, that's pretty cute, before they spot this glowing suit floating around, and Sonic follows it and ends up in an alternate dimension, and the colouring even goes completely grayscale. He meets familiar faces, such as Ms. Acorn, the hot lady of the town, and Dr. Robotnik for some reason. Seemingly this dimension's version of him, who once again appears out of nowhere to give the hedgehog trouble, and is once again tailed by combots. I'm getting a bit of deja vu here. And the ending doesn't help either. Once again, it's Sonic waking up all dizzy-like, and everyone is left wondering what the hell just happened, with his allies once again stating that Dr. Robotnik is dead and that he can't hurt him. You fuckers would make terrible therapists. Sadly, I didn't grow up in an age when Casablanca was the big thing, so I'm afraid any references or in-jokes at the original movie flies right over my head. Though it seems like this story just glazes over the source material. Galen's art is passable, even if it looks notably different than his usual style. And he even gets to draw some slapstick when all of the dudes are oogling Sally on one page. Yeah, very old school. And Mystery Science Theater 3000 called, they want their robot puppets back. But the story overall is somehow even more shallow than the last one. It's set in an alternate zone, of course, but the counterparts to Robotnik and the Freedom Fighters are dead ringers for their prime selves anyway, so what's the fucking point? I think Rollstone just really wanted to write about Casablanca. Story number two, First Contact, is definitely the better story of the two. It's extremely short, barely six pages long, but it goes into what the late Robotnik's forces, or sub-bosses, are up to, and it has the heroine make contact with the world's freedom fighters, which is pretty cool. The Sat-AM cartoon had that as a hook that never got resolution, when the king gave her a slip of paper with all of the freedom fighter groups scribbled on it somehow. I'm glad this concept is utilised here, and it gives Sally Acorn some importance as she strives to make sure Mobius is clean off the big bad's lingering influence. Praise Bollers for writing our girl as someone who doesn't just break up fights or sobs in the corner all of the damn time. Finally, some good f***ing Sally Rising. Mawinnie does a stellar job as always in drawing the panels of the Freedom Fighters, here making their first nervous steps into a world with no evil dictator. Yeah, sorry, this takes place right before Brave New World, but I reviewed that already, so what are you going to do? I don't even... Also, in one background panel, we spot the brief visualage of Mina Mongoose, though I'm not sure why she's depicted as a freedom fighter here. I guess Bollers had different plans for the character later on. 
I wish I could grade this mildly decent issue for this story alone, but it sadly came packaged with this dusty old reference piece, so that's sadly going to affect its final score. But I'm getting ahead of myself, and frankly, you're going to be begging for this style of non-seriousness, I swear on my shades. I can't say that anymore, can I? Hmm, <laughs> not one of Spaziente's best covers. I like the detail of Dr. Quack and his nervous face, but the extreme close-up, Sonic's stupid dustbin mouth, the puzzling caption and the weird transparent effect on the figure in the foreground makes for a surprisingly bland image. Not a good first impression. Story 1, Unfinished Business, is pretty much a shameless tie-in to the Knuckles comic and nothing else. Arriving in a Dark Legion saucer, Knuckles makes a reappearance after his long absence following the Sword of Acorns side quest. And he introduces his close friend Julie Sue to the gang, who he is totally not secretly in love with. But seriously, Julie Sue is cool. Most of this goddamn story is just the heroes going, hey, remember that thing that happened? Or this thing on Angel Island, which you can see now in Knuckles the Echidna issue 69 is in stores now. Um, anyhow, it's not all repetitive. Near the end, Sonic and Knuckles are shown to finally be on good terms and not picking a fight with each other for like the 16th time. We also learn from Sonic's recently discovered father that Sonic's first name is Maurice. <laughs> Holy crap, that's honestly hilarious, but regardless, I'm thankful this never f***ing stuck in future issues. Even though Penders wanted the dude to be called, and I'm not even kidding, Ogilvoy Maurice Hedgehog. You have every right to laugh. Penders, what the f*** are you smoking? And also, can I have some of that stuff, because I'm going to need that when I cover your content. Although, the name Maurice has been ties to Sonic way back in the first issue of the miniseries that kicked off the Archie Sonic book. So I guess I have both Gallagher and Penders to blame for this weird name. The story ends with Knuckles and Sonic's dad talking about their parent-son issues, before they both walk away together into the sunset. A basic story, but hey, Mawinnie's art helps it stand out a little bit. The other story, Sounds of Silence, is the real meat and potatoes of this issue, involving a group of villains breaking out of the voids to wreak havoc. These dudes consist of Ixis Norgus, a Satayem villain and a total gargoyle of a wizard who enjoys casting crystalline spells left and right just as much as he does yelling at the top of his lungs. Uh, Kodo Slyon, the former warlord before Julian Kintobor took his place, who uses an axe in battle. And Uma Arachnis, the token girl of the team who also happens to be a spider ninja because rule of cool. You can never go wrong with Norgus, even though I feel his portrayal here is still pretty two-dimensional, but Kodos and Uma I'm afraid I don't like very much, for completely different reasons. Okay, quick bitching rant, but Uma Arachnis is sadly less fleshed out than Norgus, and is only interesting for her trait alone. I don't even understand why she was even sealed in the voice, but if that's meant to play up her mystery, I'm sorry, it's totally wasted on her. Kodo Slyon, oh my god, this motherfucker is the definition of superfluous. Okay, he's meant to be a warlord, right? Just like Robotnik was, following his coup against the king and all that. He's a scheming, power-hungry villain with a plan to rise to power, also working with Ixis Norgus and wishing to get back at the Overlanders. You get where I'm going with this, right? <sighs> Barring his bloodthirstiness in battle, in terms of character in the grand scheme of this comic, Kodos is essentially just another Julian. A villain for villain's sake just to add to the roster of bad guys for Sonic to beat up. Just have Robotnik be the only power-hungry warlord for fuck's sake. Needless to say, I don't very much care for this trio's inclusion in this issue. They make for a formidable threat, and it's kind of cool to see Sonic work around their different abilities. And Norgus especially, his, his crystalline magic is still pretty cool. But the wizard's magic wand gets snapped at the end, turning Lion Man and Spider Woman into statues due to some half-explained plot points involving them having formally pledged loyalty to him in the void, I think. And Norgus gets away in the end, leaving the heroes to wonder what he's going to be up to. Lame as hell. The only parts I liked about this issue are, ironically, everything except the bad guys. The issue starts out surprisingly well, with Sonic and Sally having a heart-to-heart -heart about their plans now that the Not Whole Freedom Fighters aren't, you know, fighting anyone anymore. Although the weird close-ups and fixations on things are kind of confusing still. That and her father King Max being back into royalty, she may have to return to her duties as princess, which is bad for both the characters and their relationship. 
The cameo of Jeffrey is unwelcome as always, especially since he's still being touted as Sally's what if in terms of romantic relationships. But I kind of like King Max's recollection on what went about in the void and how he survived with Ixis Norgus. Like, this panel's really good. It's filled to the brim with narration, but look at that swirly portal with all of the cool background effects. It's drawn really well. There's even an explanation for King Max's weird Dark Knight persona, which I totally wasn't expecting. It doesn't save this issue from being a mediocre pile of shit, but it is surprising nonetheless. With that crap out of the way, you guys want to see the proper continuation to Endgame? Allow me to introduce the diamond in the rough of this bunch of issues, Carl Boller's perfect introduction story. First off, this cover is amazing! It shows us exactly what to expect, it's not too zoomed in or ruined by 90s transparency effects, and it shows all the characters in cool, corny action postures as they pose around in the background. I live for posters like this. And I love Sonic's outfit on the cover, he, he only wears it for a total of two pages, but it adds to the sense of adventure that this issue's gonna present. Or rather, the idea of one that Sonic wishes he could have. This'll all make sense later, believe me. The conflict at the end of this issue revolves around creepy ass Snively plotting his revenge on the Freedom Fighters from the confines of his prison cell. How, you might be asking? Well, from cybernetics ingrained into his fingernails, of course. <laughs> I don't make the bloody rules. He has some metallic eggs explode in some unknown location, and now the heroes are going to have to face a bunch of egg robos from Sonic and Knuckles, or egg bots as they call them here. But that's just the end of the story. The main focus of this issue is something that nobody, not even I, was expecting. If not for the incessant narration plaguing its panels, I probably would have called issue number 54 the most emotionally driven story of the early comics. We see firsthand what Sonic, our heroic and impatient fast boy, personally feels about the Freedom Fighters' victory over Robotnik. He was right there when the dude got obliterated, but he finds all the celebrations following the big bad's death tiresome. Indeed, he spends most of his well-earned freedom running around at top speed to keep himself distracted from the boredom, as well as running errands for Uncle Chuck to test his fastness for whatever reason. The Hedgehog feels totally lost without a cause or villain to fight, cringing at even the mention of adventuring. I love this page especially of Sonic finally venting about his post-war frustrations and getting some words of wisdom from Rosie while they sit in the now-populated streets. That and the pages of Sonic and Uncle Chuck finally talking about the blue dude's parents to the backdrop of Tails being outwitted by a dragonfly. It's so nice for the characters. In all seriousness, it's moments like these that I feel were severely lacking in all other Archie comic issues post-Endgame, and that includes the specials. I just really like that this issue slows down and lets the characters just breathe, you know? Even Ortega's art isn't that bad thanks to the surprisingly profound story. Sure, the depiction of Sonic's spin dash isn't pretty to look at, nor are some of the character expressions during the ceremony, but otherwise the illustrations are astoundingly decent, as were Herbert's during the Gulag interludes. Also, small thing to note, but I can't help but notice, who was on letters, Powell and Williams? Because when they were Penders created characters, the font totally changes to a more stiff one in speech bubbles. It occurs again during the rosy talk about Julela. I'm not sure what was up with that, but it's certainly distracting. Was Penders watching over the letterer's shoulders the whole time? Anyway, what's the last issue going to be about? I hope I round off this video with another bad one. Oh, no way! <laughs> Oh boy, it's everyone's favourite Journey to the West homage, Monkey Khan. For those wondering, he's essentially the product of the writer going, what if Sun Wokong, but Sonic. You know you're in for a wild ride when the cover is the most interesting thing about the entire issue, also drawn by Spaziente. Is, is that a little Mobian Buddha back there? Story 1, Monkey Madness. So the newlyweds Sonic and Sally, and also Antoine, are cruising through the woods, and despite what the cliffhanger in the last issue suggests, are not being chased by egg robos, but they do spot them drilling into the ground in a giant drill machine. Uh, fun fact, I didn't know that this and Monkey Khan's crypt were meant to be the same structure because of the inconsistencies in the art. It's an overall issue I have with the illustrations here. Unless you're one of the four main characters, nothing else in these panels gets much focus or formal introductions. Anyway, Sally breaks our new character from his hidden crypt, a rebellious cyborg built by Dr. Robotnik that unexplicably resembles a flesh-and-blood Mobian of vaguely Eastern influence. 
Yeah, that's how you know this was printed in the 90s. I should be thankful he wasn't depicted as speaking in offensive anguish. As much of a copy of the Monkey King as he is, Khan's not that bad a character. He could probably do less boasting about his skills, but otherwise he's pretty good. Plain, but good. I don't like the dialogue, is, is what I'm saying. Okay, so this monkey guy, he, he picks a fight with Sonic, who mistakes him for messing around with his girlfriend and spin dashes at him, and then Khan gets a look at Sally's radiant beauty that he hadn't noticed before because he was too busy telling the audience his backstory, I guess. And then the princess gets kidnapped because of course she does. What the f***? This leaves Sonic and Antoine to have to work together despite their constant clashes, even though I thought they were over this already. This isn't the Sati M cartoon, they, they can get along now. And Sally talks some sense into Khan so that he can fry the hell out of the Egg Robos, though Sonic gets the last hit on them, of course. It is his comic. Monkey Khan flies away on his Goku Cloud and is shown to be on good terms with Sonic at the end, surprisingly. All in all, a rather forgettable story. Uh, Frank Storm wrote for this one and all subsequent Eastern-inspired stories until the change of writers in issue number 160. He's worked on a lot of comics over the years, but I haven't dug into them so I can't give a general opinion on his writing style. In Archie Sonic, it's kind of a mix of Gallagher's casually silly narrative and Boller's more serious tone, which I'm afraid makes him right in the middle of the good and bad scale. I think the only funny line of dialogue was this one amid all of the typical comic booky lines. He also did the art for this story, and there is where I draw the line, personally. Can't say I'm a fan of the way he draws the characters, though the backdrops look appropriately dynamic. I do kind of like that it looks similar to old anime. <laughs> You can tell with some of the character expressions here. It gives the art style a very vintage look. That would add to this issue's charm, if I didn't know that all of these characters are written way better and less flat in future stories. Next please. Story 2, Rise of the Robians. Ooh, more like Rise of the Angry Mob. Oh boy, time to get into the subtext thrust before us. Okay, uh, you remember at the end of Brave New World where they hinted at the roboticized Mobians being oppressed and wanting to form their own society away from the flesh and blood peeps because they just weren't accepted? Well, here we see firsthand the kind of oppression they face with this angry mob led by uh, Tusk Loser ganging up on, uh, Fanny. Even King Max is against the Robians, now taking Robotnik's chair in what was formerly the Royal Palace and decreeing that all roboticized civilians be dismantled simply for the fact that they are Robians. This is so dreadful a decision that even Geoffrey St. John is against it, earning him a whack in the head. The good guys all show up in the middle of the King's Royal Tantrum and he suddenly passes out, having drained all of his energy, and now Knuckles is suddenly in danger on Angel Island, ending this issue on yet another cliffhanger. Sonic finishes it off with a silly nonchalant quote addressing the readers, probably because he's just as done with this possessed King subplot as we are. I have no f***ing clue what Edward's artistic studios are, but they and Mr. Underwood didn't do a top-notch job on this story's visuals. The colours are fine, and I kind of dig Turkey Girl's design, but in the second half, everyone, Jeffrey, King Max, Antoine, everyone, gets deformed chibi bodies that make their heads look slightly enlarged. It takes away a lot of the tension and dramatic panels that the comic wants us to experience, which is already really lacking. There's nothing else I can really say about the visuals, it just really drags the whole story down with it. Not the kind of issues I'd end a video on, but sometimes after a grand finale like Endgame, you gotta have your trash before something shiny and new comes along, even in old Sonic comics. Issue number 51 is bar none the lowest point of the post-Endgame issues. It's just a bunch of nonsense that was made to either fill up space, or because the guys at Archie legit had no idea what to publish. It's f***ing trash, so it shall get a score of 3. Issue 51 was half good and half mediocre. Growing up, I started having an appreciation for slow-paced stories of the characters, although in this case, I guess all the Casablanca references were just not made for me, or any of the kids reading it at the time. I can't speak for them, but for me, this was average, so... five. Issue 53 was more of the same, just as plain. The story of investigating Robotropolis was my favourite, though the Void bad guys appearing mostly fell short. They weren't threatening at all, and most of the time I couldn't tell what the hell was going on with the unintentionally surreal pencils. You have to really squint your eyes to see what's going on in these pages. For these issues, I'd say it gets a rank of 5 out of 10 as well. Issue 54, on the other hand, is probably the biggest surprise this time around. 
like number 51, it's one single story instead of two, and it makes full use of its 21 pages. It had a lot of heart, way more than any other Sonic comic of its era, and several earnest and profound moments. So, you know what? F*** it. It gets a 7 out of 10. Issue number 53 brings it back to Boar Town with the lackluster introduction of the comic's Eastern-inspired influences with Monkey Khan, and the extra story of tasteless themes emphasised by a Mad King lashing out at everyone around him, Mobians and Robians alike. It's meant to be serious and a real attention grabber, but it just isn't. There are better ways to have oppressive undertones without it just being just so on the nose. Overall, this issue is more average, so I'll award it a 5 out of 10. In the next video, I'm not gonna look at all these door cage comics, it's like 100 plus issues of mediocrity that I don't care to analyse. I'll have to pick and choose carefully, like the Robo Robotic arc, the Robo the Hedge issues, or maybe even... I'm gonna review a Man Baby spin-off.